computer. Okay. All right, we're recording. Hope that's okay with you guys. I don't say anything incriminating. Uh, let's um, let's jump into it. So here we are. We've begun the the book of Devarim, and the book of Devarim is is fascinating. We're at the end of Moshe's life, and here he is uh, wondering what it is that he's going to share with the Jewish people. What are his, what's his final legacy? And so we begin what's called the Mishnah Torah, the repetition of the Torah, but of course he adds new things. And as we'll see, he's going to add even, you know, there are some new mitzvot that are mentioned in this, in this Parsha, in this, in this book, I should say. But he goes over a lot of them, and this this week's partial is really going over the the events that were really the most kind of pivotal events in in the history of the Jewish the, the very short history of the Jewish people. But he will add new details, and we're gonna we're gonna look at some of those new details. I want to begin, however, with looking at just the strange nature of the book of Moshe, essentially speaking, right? Moshe says, Eile hadvarim, these are the words, asher diber Moshe, I'll call Israel, that Moshe spoke to Israel and to all, you know, on the other side, sorry, Be'ezer Hayadin, on the other side of the Jordan. Bamidbar barava mol suf ben parano ben tofel velavan vechaserot vedizahav. Through the wilderness in the Arava near Suf, between Paran and Tofel and Lavan, Chater and Dizahav, all of those names do have some significance, but we're not going to get into that right now. Here's Moshe Elahad Devarim. Uh, he he speaks these words, and he goes on and he speaks for a very long time. This is quite a long uh, soliloquy, right? It's not like the other books of the Torah. And what is strange about that? Again, I don't want this to just be me speaking here. Uh, but rather, I would love to hear from you. What is strange about Moshe speaking in such a way? Yes, Roz, you, you look like you're rare and Yeah, I've got something to say. Uh, in the beginning, he says he was, he was stumbled. He was not good as a speaker uh, yeah. when he's approached in the burning bush episode. Exactly. But he's had more than 40 years, because there was, what, about a year before that he left Egypt, so there were many times that he had to go to Pharaoh, to Pharaoh to develop as a leader and as a speaker. So okay, good. So you're, you're, now, you're anticipating, Roz, you're anticipating the question, right? So the, buried in your statement is a question. The question is, wait a second. We know that Moshe is, as we see here in the, the second verse there, a person of impeded speech. How is power going to listen to me, right? I've got a, a speech impediment, right? And so you say, but no, so he's healed, or he's, he's been able to overcome his stutter, maybe. Maybe he has some sort of stutter, like, you know, you, if you've seen the, the King's Speech, right, and how the, it's a great movie, if you haven't seen it. Um, he's over, been able to overcome that, right? So he's, he's changed, and this is 40 years later, exactly, and he's had a lot of experience of speaking. But nonetheless, the question is still stands. I mean, you've given an answer, right? So the question is, how can it be that Paro, I'm sorry, that Moshe, who had a speech impediment, so we think, and now here he is speaking at great length, right? Any thoughts on, on this matter? I want to point out initially. And no, I yes, you. Paul, you unmute yourself no. intentionally, or you just no, want to? No, no. Okay. Um, well, people do learn. Pe human beings are capable of learning and and changing. And experience can bring about changes in people. It happens all the time. Yeah. Okay. Good. So that answer. It says low system resources may affect your audio. Qua. Hold on a second. Give me a moment here. It's telling me that my I'm going to have some issues with audio quality. I'm just going to close some windows. I'm a serial window opener. <laughs> give, give me a second here. All 
Oh, wait, I just closed the wrong one. <laughs> Sorry, I just closed the one I didn't want to. Give me a moment. I'm just going to open that one back up. Who else is on? All right, thank you. Yeah, not many people. Godness can. All right, sorry, I got you back in here. Almost. Sorry about that. Okay. Now, uh, Paul, what you said is correct in the sense that people can learn, which is uh, similar to what Roz mentioned. But what's strange about that is there is a, uh, a midrash that everyone knows about Moshe that would imply it's not necessarily just kind of like a psychological shift that he needs to make, right? Rather, a physical one. Everyone knows this Midrash so much that this is a great example of a Midrash that people mix up with Pshat. Now, does everyone know what I mean by that? Right? There's, when we have, so there's the Pshat, which is the simple meaning, and the simple, what's actually written in the text. And then the rabbis write these Midrashim, sometimes fanciful, sometimes just emerging from the use of words. And that's a very basic idea. But there are certain Midrashim that people are, they're, they're so widespread that people have come to believe that they are exactly what happened. This is one of them. The idea that Moshe touched the, uh, the hot coal and then burned his, his tongue and therefore the speech impediment, that's kind of taught by everybody and all my kids know that and therefore they grow up thinking that that's what happened. Can anyone give me some other examples of Midrashim that we know that like have become just you know, so well accepted. Yes, Roz, what do you think? The one about uh, Adam, um, not Adam, uh, Abraham breaking the idols in his father's shop. Exactly, great, right? So that idea of, of Abraham, that's a backstory, right? It's kind of like the Midrash is like, uh, is kind of like fan fiction, you know, you know that genre of fan fiction where people take a, uh, a movie, Star Wars, and they write their own backstories of things, you know, so it's kind of like it's fan fiction in, in essence, uh, and they fill in the story. Uh, and so, yeah, Avram breaking the idols. Great. He didn't do, you know, it doesn't say that anywhere. Also to Avram and, you know, Nimrod uh, trying to cut off Avram's head and his neck turning to stone. Uh, Batya, the daughter of Tara, reaching out her arm, then it's stretching. Uh, in all these things, you know, there are these stories that are so... Uh, just deeply ingrained within our psyche that they have become shot, but they're not, they're not. Uh, and this is an example of it. So what do we see here? Again, this is just people, people are familiar with this Midrash. It says, and the child Moshe grew, 24 months she knew him. And you say that the child grew, rather he grew not in the way of the rest of the land. And she brought him to the daughter of Paro, right? This is obviously the mother, Moshe's mother was raising him as a wet nurse. The daughter of Para would kiss and hug and adore him as if he were her own son. And she would not take him out of the king's palace. And because Moshe was so beautiful, everyone yearned to see him. This is Midrash. One that would see would not leave his presence. And it was that Para would kiss him and hug him. And he'd remove Para's crown and place it on his own head as he would do to him in the future when he was great. So, you know, like this little baby is kind of like, Baby Moshe is sitting on Paro's lap and taking the crown, putting it on his, on his head. Okay, and let's, let's go down. So it says, And some of the observers sitting among, among them were magicians of Egypt that said, We are wary of this, that he is taking your crown place on his head, that he not be the one we say that will take the kingship from you. Some said to kill him and some said to burn him. And Yitro, who will show up a little bit later on in Oshir, and Yitro said, and Yitro was sitting among them and said to them, the child has no intent to take the throne. Rather, test him by bringing a bowl, a piece of gold and a coal. If he outstretches his hand towards the gold, surely he has intent to take the throne, and you should kill him. And if he outstretches his hand toward the coal, he surely does not have intent to take the throne. He does not deserve the death penalty. They immediately brought the bowl before him, 
and he outstretched his hand to take the gold, and Gavriel came, pushed Moshe's hand, and he grabbed the coal. He then brought his hand along with the coal to his mouth and burned his tongue. And from this was made a slow of speech and slow of tongue. And she called his name Moshe. Okay, we'll, we'll leave it there for now. Okay, so, right, again, famous idea. He reaches towards the coal and touches and burns his mouth, and therefore he has a speech impediment. So if he has a speech impediment, now, if it's a physical speech impediment, it is still possible through um, speech pathology to, to heal and to be able to, to speak, but it's quite a remarkable thing. It is quite a remarkable thing, correct? Yes? Now, one could say that there is something uh, about just the nature of being involved in Torah, the nature of being involved in Torah that heals. So Moshe has been for his whole life, as Roz and Paul spoke about, his whole life being involved in these sorts of things. And it's not merely, we're not talking about someone merely who's been teaching Torah, like the way I'm speaking to you right now, or I should say, not for somebody who's speaking up in public and, you know, and running, you know, business meetings and stuff like that. Here is someone who's been the, the, the vessel through which the word of God is revealed. And so it has a healing property. I want to look at an interesting, another midrash with all of you here and see what it says. Any questions before I do that? Any comments? Okay. These are the words. Halacha. Adam Yisrael ma'u sh'yeh mutar lo lichtov sefer Torah b'chol lashon. Is a Jewish person permitted to write a Torah scroll in any language? Right? Can you write a Torah in a different language? This is what the sages taught. The only difference between scrolls and tefillin or mezuzot is that scrolls may be written in any language. So a Torah can be written in any language. Rabban Gamliel said, one is not even permitted for scrolls unless they are written in Greek. The only language that you're allowed to write a Sefer Torah in, and again, we're not talking about a Chumash, we're talking about a, a Torah scroll to be read from, is Greek. Wild. That's a wild thing. And when we get to, uh, to Hanukkah, that is an idea that is often uh, kind of expounded and expanded upon about the similarities between Greek culture and Jewish culture, but that's not for now at this moment. What is Rabban Gamliel's reasoning that one is permissible to write a Torah scroll in Greek? This is how our rabbis taught. Bar Kapara said, it is written, this is when God is blessing the children of, of Noah, may God extend yefet, yaft elokim leyefet, beishkon ba'ahalei shem. May God extend yefet, may he dwell in the tents of shame, and we believe that yefet the son of Noah went to Greek. Sorry, went to Greece and to Europe. And that's really where Greek civilization came from. Okay? That the words of shame, right, and that's also the connection here. May God extend yes and may he dwell in the tents of shame. What's the tents of shame? That's where they learn Torah. That the words of shame may be spoken in the language of yes, that therefore it is permitted that they should be written in the Greek language. So we do see that there is this other language, but nonetheless, Hebrew is something different. The Holy One, blessed be He, said, see how the language of the Torah is so dear that it heals the tongue. From where do we know this? How do we know this? Since it says, Marpela shon eitz chayim. It says that a healing tongue is a tree of life. And the tree of life only refers to the Torah, as it is said, is it is a tree of life to those who grasp on to her. The language of the Torah makes the tongue fluent. And so we can suggest, based upon this statement, that learning the Torah and speaking the Torah is what heals Moshe's tongue. The tongue that was burned is now healed, and now he can go on and speak at great length. He, uh, you know, it is speaking. In essence, that is the highest uh, real form of human beings, right? Which is what in, in many ways separates us from all other animals. And from the Torah perspective, it is our ability to speak. 
not just make sound, not just communicate. Yes, all animals communicate with each other in some way, but the way in which we communicate is unique. And I'll just pause in, in a moment for, for questions and comments, but I just wanna just to kind of, these are well-known ideas, so we're not giving any chidushim here, but the Torah says, in, in, in terms of the creation of Adam and Chava, Vayitzer Hashem Elokim et Adam Afar Min Hadama, and God, Hashem God, created, formed man from the dust of the earth, Vayipach Be'apav Nishmat Chayim, and he blew into his nostrils the spirit of life, the soul of life, Vayihi Adam L'Nefesh Chaya, and man became a living being. And the Unclus there explains what does this mean that he was a living being? So Unclus is a, a translation from Hebrew into Aramaic. And in the Aramaic, and then off, often Unclus, who was a tremendous scholar, so he taught us certain things in the way in which he translated the word. And so he translates of Vayhi Adam Lenefesh Chaya, and man became a living being. Vehavat Adam Luruach Mimalala, and he became a speaking spirit. That what was it that God? What is this Nishama? What was it that God spoke or, or breathed into man the ability to speak? But it's not just speech, right? It's not just kind of like you know blah blah, blah right? It's it's something very very deep. Speech is the deepest in essence right? Why is speech so deep? What do we know about speech, right? What, what happens with speech? This is an open question. You've got body language that can convey emotions, okay. and you can, with the expression of your face, uh, tell people whether you're happy or sad, but you really need speech to convey your thoughts to another person. Right, it's the, it's the conveyance of thoughts, but I want to go even deeper. It's about relationship. Right, it's what allows there to be relationships, which is really what the whole Torah is, is all about, the whole purpose of the Torah. And I want to go even one step deeper than that, and that is that we know how did God create the world? Through speech, right? The, what's called the Asara Ma'amarot, the ten utterances in, in the first chapter of Breshid, it says Vayomer nine times, and then Breshid is, is said as, uh, as the tenth. So he spoke Vayomer, and God said, God, Hashem spoke creation into being. We create, we literally create worlds through our speech. And this is the highest uh, realm. The highest realm is the person to be able to have real control over their speech. And so it's Moshe, through his involvement and through his transformation, his power of speech becomes healed so that he can say what becomes some of the most uh, you know, uh, eloquent and powerful sukim in the entire Torah are in the book of Devarim. So he goes through this process. Thoughts, questions. How are we going? Okay. So I want to, before I'm, I'm going to move on to the second half of the year. There's really two different topics that I want to explore with you today. I just want to look at one final source on, on this. And that is the Gvurot Hashem, which is the Maharal, the Maharal of Prague, the great, uh, the great, rabbi who unfortunately is be better known for the creation of the golem than anything else uh, that he's done. But he is, of course, a very big, uh, a huge, a massive Torah scholar who influenced uh, everybody in the past 400, 500 years. Uh, but people know that he just made the golem. So he didn't, I don't think he actually did make the golem. He said how to do it, uh, but it's attributed to him. The Maharal says the following thing. He gives a totally different approach. He doesn't say anything. He's not saying that, that Moshe had a speech impediment. That's not what's going on here. What's happening? So there's just Hebrew here, and I apologize for that. You'll have to trust me. 
ויאמר משה להשם, פי השם לא איש דברים אנוכי השם, I am not a man of words. Right? He says, Lo ish dvarim anochi. I'm not a man of words. Now, that's quite a jump then to Eila had dvarim. These are the words that Moshe spoke. So the Maharal asks, Yesh la akshot. We can ask the question. Moshe shahaya lo kol ha-ma'alot ve'af shlimu taguf haya lo ve'af shlimu taguf haya lo k'mo sh'amru al komato u'b'chol davar e'ch haya ze shlo haya ish dvarim so he says, we can ask the question, Moshe was a fully developed being. Moshe is not like a guy like me and you, the Maharal says, the Maharal is well beyond anything we can possibly imagine. Moshe is like, you know, he, he's the highest, he reached the highest level that any human being in the history of humanity has reached. He had what we would call a, uh, a koma shlema, Full stature, which is a Kabbalistic statement. The Maharal was deeply influenced by Kabbalah. Uh, and the idea is that you might have seen the Sfirot in Kabbalah. I don't know how familiar people are with the Sfirot. Nod your head if you are, have some sense of what I'm talking about. I'm just going to scroll down the Sfirot. Those of you who have your, your cameras off, I can't help you. Uh, so the Sfirot are these divine emanations, these qualities that uh, God has that he then invested within all of humanity, all of human beings, this wisdom and understanding and intellect and kindness and, and uh, you know, and, and discipline and strength and, and harmony, right? When I'm, this is not a, a shear in Kabbalah, but the idea is that all of us have certain qualities that we're kind of more drawn towards and more and stronger in, and, and we have certain weaknesses and on our our life's journey is to try to develop ourselves and our, our, all elements of our personality as much as we can so that we become as fully in line with the will of God as we possibly can. Moshe did that within rabbinic uh, you know, uh, philosophy, within Kabbalistic philosophy. Moshe is called the, the Komash Lema. He received the full stature. Not, you know, it wasn't just a gift. He worked on it. Everything was perfect in a sense for Moshe. Not perfect, okay, you got people asking, well, he hit the rock, yes, Moshe made mistakes. But Moshe was, you know, he reached this, right? How could it possibly be the Maharal says, how could it possibly be that he wasn't a man of speech? So he gives a different answer, okay? Da, no. Kimipnei shahaya Moshe rachok min hachomer. Moshe was actually very distant from Chomer. What's Chomer? Materialism, right? Moshe was very distant, disconnected from materialism. So he says, sorry, that the, the power of speech is so, is a very physical one, right? Like, you know, as I'm seeing, I'm not, I don't, I'm just kind of paraphrasing. When I'm seeing something or smelling something, I'm just, I'm just sitting here, right? When I'm hearing, I'm, it's all passive. But the, the ability of speech, it must be active. It's, it's completely bound up in the physical world. So Moshe is so, he's got this vision of spirituality that's so profound. And he had, what did he, what, so how is the Maharal explaining this? He had difficulty then translating that spirituality into physicality. So it's not that Moshe had a speech impediment. Remember, that's a Midrash, okay? You could accept it, you don't have to accept it. The Maharal says no. Moshe was so spiritually, uh, you know, expansive that he had difficulty. His difficulty was then taking that down and relating it to physical matters. And there was his growth, right? His growth was then 
over those 40 years, stepping into himself and learning how to take these broad visions of spirituality and be able to communicate it to the, uh, the simplest person before. I, those of you who are in my 929 share will be familiar with the story. You know, when I was in yeshiva, I was, I was in one yeshiva after Israel, and I wanted to go to a second yeshiva, which is considered like a higher, uh, a more serious yeshiva where they're, you know, better learners. And there was a, uh, the rabbi who was really the reason why I wanted to go to that second yeshiva, who, you know, just a brilliant, brilliant man. And I was really drawn to Torah because of this guy. And I went to go have a, uh, a what you call a fahir, right? They gave me a, um, a test, right? To see if I could hack it. Like, what, was, I up to, was I up to scratch? And so I went to travel to this rabbi's apartment in, in Bnei Brak in Yerushalayim. And I sat down and, you know, so what does he do? There's different ways that they do these tests. Sometimes they just, you know, they take a gemar off the shelf, flip it open, point to it and say, okay, go. Uh, I'm lucky he didn't, <laughs> he didn't do that test. But instead he said, okay, open up to what you're learning right now. Okay, so we open up to, to where we're learning. And then he says, okay, now read me the Gemara, right? You read the Gemara. And then he says, okay, I want you now to explain this Gemara to me like I'm, and I apologize, this might not translate. We'll find the, 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 the translation in a moment. But he says, I want you to explain it to me like I'm Billy Bob from Arkansas, right? Which would be like, uh, I don't know, um, uh, give me an example. <laughs> What's the most Aussie name? What's the most Aussie name you can get? A, a layman. No, Bruce. give me a name. Bruce. Like Bruce, Bruce from, from Aubrey, from Wollongong, right? Yeah, would that work? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you, got, well, you know, I want you to explain it to me like Bruce. Do we have any Bruces here today? No, okay. Uh, <laughs> like, like I'm Bruce from, from whatever, right? Um, from Yohopitzville. Now, what's the idea behind that? The idea is that, okay, you can know it. And then if, if you know, like right now, we, we're having a conversation and there is assumed information, right? There is assumed shared knowledge that I can speak in certain codes and we get it. And some of you might get it less, right? And that's part of the issue. Uh, but, but most of us, we speak a certain language. But imagine if somebody comes from off the street and I'm talking about all these things, I'm throwing in all these words and... You know, so when you, when you teach someone the Gemara, well, you actually got to step back and say, well, what is this Gemara? And so what he wanted to see is, can you take a, an idea and then translate it? The better teacher, the better knowledge, you know, the, the more knowledgeable you are, the more you have an ability to communicate it in layman's terms, to use Elizabeth's uh, phrase before. There's a great uh, series on YouTube, you might, some of you might have seen it, where they take different people at different levels of, of um, kind of development and they take these experts and they explain concepts on different levels. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? Like there's uh, Herbie Hancock, the great jazz pianist, you know, or, and, or Jacob Collier. I don't know if anybody knows who J Jacob Collier is. He's an incredible young musician, like this genius musician. And he's become very, very popular because of his harmonies. And so he comes to explain harmony to first to like a five-year-old and then to a 15-year-old and then to a, uh, a university student studying music and then to a professional musician, right? So the idea is then to take it and that shows real proficiency, right? That shows real understanding if you can communicate it on those different levels. Can you help a five-year-old get it? And so, right, we just step back for a moment. Moshe had this profound understanding of God, but yet where, where he struggled was the ability to then be able to communicate it to, in, in, in layman's terms. And his healing, his transformation was in learning just how to do that. And that's what brings us to Elah HaDevarim, these words of Moshe. Thoughts, comments, questions? Well, he's become... He's become an outstanding teacher then because he understands what it is that's going on inside the heads of the people that he's talking with. Yeah. Um, which is actually one of the marks of, of an outstanding teacher. Uh, many teachers think that just going through the words and telling students 
what this means and that means, is that sufficient to explain an idea? But it hardly ever is. Yeah. Uh, it, requires this, it requires the teacher to find out what's going on inside the heads of the students, and the good teacher can do that. Maybe that's what Moses was able to do. Yeah, I would say so, right? And what, what, do, we, what do we call Moshe? We don't call Moshe Moshe Hanavi, right? We say Eliyahu, El, El, we say Eliyahu Hanavi, right? We don't say Moshe Hanavi. He was the greatest Navi. Why don't we call Moshe Moshe Hanavi? What do we call him? Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe, our teacher. teacher. Mm -hmm. Our teacher. He's, mm. he's our teacher, exactly. So, yeah, I mean, it's, that, that's, a, that's a beautiful statement. I mean, teaching is, is actually really about, um, it's, it's I don't know. I, you, you almost have to kind of project the idea into the minds of other people and you have to know other, you know, know those people. And, and it's much is happening on, on lots of different levels, not just the words, which by the way, is why homeschooling on this or this remote thing. So we're able to, we can focus a little bit. It's not ideal. I'm, I'm actually looking at myself talk. I'm not looking at you guys talk, right? Like, it's, it's a weird thing. Who do, I, who do I choose to focus on throughout this time, right? I can't sense the energy in the room. Some of you don't have your cameras on, uh, you know? And it's even worse when I'm teaching high school. It's really, really hard. Uh, it's, it's not, it's okay in the meantime when we have no better alternative. But it's a far cry from, from what real teaching is about. It's about feeling that energy and being able to communicate on that level. Elizabeth, you wanted to share something. I, I just thought that perhaps over the period of time he was gathering all the knowledge and he has that innate ability to be able to pass, out, pass it on at all the various levels and bring, um, bring all that knowledge that he was gathering and, and collected all those years to whoever he needed to, hmm. at whatever level he needed to. And that was yeah. something, the qualities he had. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. Beautiful. Roz, you wanted to say something? Yes. Uh, although Moses is uh, shown to us to not be a real people person, that was Aaron, uh, you still, as a teacher, learn from your students. You know, like the old song from The King and I, uh, from your pupils, you will be, your best teacher is your pupil. I think it's Pirke Avot. They got, probably got, was it Rogers and Hammerstein? Who is, yes. who wrote, um, who wrote The King and I, Rogers and Hammerstein? Yeah. They probably yeah, got it from Pierre, so. Pierre Cayavo, right? <laughs> yeah. I don't know about that, but... <laughs> it, well, exactly, right? If you, you know, that's, that's for sure. Um, yeah, most, and, and yeah, so it's remarkable to see kind of his, his change. And yes, he wasn't exactly the, the people person and he wasn't the one who's going to take him into the land of Israel either, right? They needed something different. And that's, that's an important thing to, to speak about. Uh, any final comments before we actually... my, my intention was to spend the majority of the time in the second half uh, here, but that didn't, didn't seem to work out. Uh, but Ed, do I have any, any comments here? Any final things? Okay. Uh, but I just wanted, just wanted to say That's one thing that struck sure. me is also, we, we all know about the famous words that Mo Moshe was the most humble person. And yeah. I think there's something about that, that, that where you can see a connection between humility and speech sometimes that Sometimes it's the humble people we think of as the people who, you know, say little and do much and just mm. keep their mouths shut, you know, and don't talk too much. And yeah. there's sort of like a connection in my mind between what you're saying and that sort of facet of things too. Yeah, I mean, I don't, you know, we only see the words that Moshe speaks. We don't have like everyday, you know, encounters for Moshe, right? But I, he doesn't strike me as the person who wastes words, right? He doesn't strike me as the guy kind of has like, you know, banter by the uh, by the water cooler right and it, that, that was probably part of the issue uh but he was so beyond everybody uh but yes it's that power of speech the power of the way in which he used and it, that coming from that deep humility if only we knew right where's humility coming from humility's real humility is coming from just a, a deep awe a deep sense of of the, the, the all-encompassing presence of god in every, in every moment, in every encounter, in everything. And if our lives were only filled with that, and you know, like just even, even a drop of that, that would deeply impact the way in which we use our words. And of course, we are now in, in the, 
uh, the nine days and, and were we thinking about how to fix these things and so many, you know, so many, uh, so much destruction has come about just the way in which people use their words. And so this is a time of tikkun, a time to try to fix those things. Okay, I want to move on to a, a different topic, uh, which is, is fascinating. And I did explore some of this with you guys in the 929 shear a little while back, but I think it was like two years ago. So, you know, <laughs> I didn't remember learning it, so I don't think you remembered hearing it. I <laughs> Although I don't know, some of you have better memories than I do. Uh, but what's fascinating here is in, we have in, in Parsha Tzvarim, not in Sefer Tzvarim, but in Parsha Tzvarim, we have the recollection of specific events, right? We have the recollection of the appointment of the judges, as well as what main thing, right? What's the main uh, kind of uh, big event that Moshe speaks about in Parsha Tzvarim? Anybody know? Just call it out. When you go into the land? Right, but what specifically? There was something that Moshe said, uh, uh, an uh, event. Sorry? There was an event that Moshe specifically was focusing on. This is, of course, the sin of the spies, right? This is the, the big narrative that Moshe tells over. So there's a couple of things that Moshe recalls that happened earlier in the Torah, but what? They are different. He tells the stories differently, right? He adds details or leaves out details in both of those cases, okay? So I just want to take a little moment to look at that and look at some of the, the differences that, and even the contradictions in the way in which he told over what had happened earlier in the Torah and to think about how we can resolve these contradictions or not, all right? So first, we, what we have is um, Moshe talking about how Hashem basically, you know, Moshe was overwhelmed. He was overwhelmed by the people. He couldn't deal with it. So let's just look. I'm just going to read the words quickly, and I, you know, I want you to try to pick up you know, the important points here. Thereupon I said to you, I cannot bear the burden of you by myself. The Lord your God has multiplied you until you are today as numerous as the stars in the sky. May the Lord your God, and then he just stops and, and blesses them. May the Lord your God, the God of your fathers, increase your number to thousandfold and bless you as he promised you. And then he, he switches, and this is often when we read this, uh, this is one of several times in which this word, echa, appears both in the Parsha here, Parsha Devarim, in the Haftorah, echa comes up, and then of course we read echa this week, and that's a really unique uh, kind of um, occurrence, right? It's, it's certainly not random. Uh, so echa esalevadi, how can I bear the unaided trouble of you and the burden and the bickering, right? Moshe's like, I can't deal with you guys. I mean, imagine, right? Imagine you're dealing with all of the Jews at the same time, right? We deal with like very small percentages and, and it's difficult. Deals with all the Jews at the same time. So what does he say? Pick from each of your tribes men who are wise, discerning and experienced, and I will appoint them as your heads. You answered me and said, what you propose to do is good, so Hashem said, okay, fine, that works. So I took your tribal leaders, wise and experienced men, and appointed them heads over you, chiefs of thousands, chiefs of hundreds, chiefs of fifties, and chiefs of tens, et cetera, et cetera. I charge you magistrates at that time and said, here at your fellow man, blah, 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 right? Not blah, 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 God forbid. But what does Moshe say? I take tribal leaders. I suggest this, Hashem, I can't do this by myself. I need some help. Hashem says, great, good idea. And then Moshe comes along and says, okay, I'm going to take the tribal leaders, these wise men, and they are going to help me out and, you know, we'll set up courts and magistrates, et cetera, et cetera. What's missing from this? Yitro. 
Right, you can see that a little bit hiding under there at the bottom, no, no, right? I, I, remember, <laughs> I remember. I was the one who came to him and said, that's what you have to do. Exactly, originally. right? Yeah. You know, it's kind of like convenient, you know, like uh, convenient uh, uh, omission to say, oh, <laughs> it was my idea the whole time, right? It was my idea. All right, so let's just look here. It says, Vayomer choten Moshe Allah, but Moshe's father said to him, father said to him, the thing you do is not right. So Moshe didn't, doesn't say, how can I do this on my own? Yitro comes along and points it out, right? So what are some answers that we can give as to why is it that Moshe chose not to mention that here? What do you think? Well, he's not all that humble after all. He likes to... <laughs> okay. Yeah, it could but, be. One answer. Yeah. That could be. Any other there, answers? <laughs> there, sorry. Well, there is a joke about, there's a joke about that. Um, Golda Meir reportedly said to um, yeah. Moshe Dayan, don't be so humble. You're not that good. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> but uh, isn't this... Devarim taking place after they've already had a war against Midian. And so he's got to, he can't um, praise too much any Midianic person, if there's such a word. Okay, but that's, it's a uh, machatanim, you know, like, uh, you know, I, I hear you. I hear what you're saying. So, like, it's kind of like, you know, uh, they're like accursed people. You don't want to mention that. Yeah, that could be. That's an interesting approach. Any other ideas? So, I mean, it, it is possible to suggest that actually the first time through, he didn't mention anything to anybody either. And it wasn't so important for people to know in the beginning. And similar to what Roz was saying, the people, if they knew really where it was coming from, maybe they'd say, hey, how can you listen to this, this guy, right? Forget, forget that he's a Midianite, what happened later on. He's this kind of Midianite priest. He's an idolater. Moshe, it's, it's, you know, Pshet, it's, 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 um, it's Treif, right? It's a non-Jewish uh, idea and you're taking it, Moshe. So Moshe, it's possible he, we learned the truth earlier, but what he told them, he didn't tell it to them earlier that it was Yitro's idea because it wasn't essential information for them at that time because maybe they wouldn't have understood it or they wouldn't have accepted it had they known what its source was. And so, so too, also, 40 years later, they don't necessarily know who Yitro is either. I mean, they, maybe they understood in the Torah. I don't know what form of the Torah they would have understood or what they would have known. But Moshe, it wasn't essential information for them. There's another uh, difference that, uh, that, that's picked up. I'm going to read some of the sources, uh, the verses. I want you to see if you could pick up, and I, I, I uh, emphasized it earlier, so let me know if you pick up a difference between what Moshe did in Shemot when he appointed these leaders and how he retold the story here in Devarim. Vayichar Moshe an shechayil mikol Yisrael vayitenotam roshim al ha'am. Moshe chose capable men out of all of Israel and appointed them heads over the, the people, chiefs of thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Naomi, do you see the difference there? He, he, that's saying just capable men. Before it was the, the actual leaders, wasn't exactly, it? Exactly, right? So, so I, took, I took your tribal leaders. Hmm. Not necessarily the most capable. Maybe. Okay, that's a different way of looking at it, okay? <laughs> <laughs> that's a different way of looking at it. Uh, that's, that's an interesting approach. Um, that's not exactly what I was looking for, but you could, you could suggest such a thing. But well, why would he put the emphasis here on the tribal leaders and then he's saying, I, you know, he chose capable men. There might be a very pragmatic answer to this. Well, now they're tribal leaders, right? Then they were capable men. And 40 years later, if they're still alive, but the sort of guy, you know, now they were tribal leaders. They probably knew about those guys, right? And, and you know, they had made a name for themselves. Oh, so it's uh, the other way around. It's the, cap it's the capable men who, who then became the tribal leaders. Exactly, exactly. Uh -huh. So again, those are, those are some, um, those are interesting omissions or interesting uh, differences, but let's get into some of the, the deeper ones. 
And the, the, what's the biggest one is, of course, the phone. Then all of you came to me and said, this is Devar and Moshe telling over the story of the spies. Then all of you came to me and said, let us send men ahead to reconnoitre or something, the land for us, and bring back the word on the route we shall follow and the cities we shall come to. I approved of the plan, and so I selected 12 of your men, one from each tribe. Okay? You all came to me, and I said, and, and you said, let's do this. And I said, fine. What happens in Parshat Shlach? The Lord spoke to Moshe saying, send men to scout the land of Canaan, which I'm giving to the Israelite people. Send one man from each of their ancestral tribes, each one a chieftain among them. Okay, what's the big contradiction? It's quite obvious, it stands out here. But one came from God and one came from Moshe. Or, well, it wasn't exactly from Moshe. Oh, from, from the people. From right, the, the people oh. I- initiated. Yeah. And then Moshe gave the suggestion, you are correct, God isn't mentioned there, right? God isn't mentioned in Devarim. It's the people initiate. Moshe says, fine. Whereas here, it's just Moshe, um, you know, it's just Moshe doing that. Okay, what Maybe. else? Yeah. Maybe it's that, that he wanted them to, to, that they needed to take responsibility for what happened there yeah. because they didn't do what actually was intended. Good. Okay. We'll see, we'll see how that's communicated in a couple of other, uh, of other ways as well. Let's look. I'm just going to look at some of these other uh, other contradictions between the, the, the story of the spies as is recounted here and as is what happened earlier. So here again in Devarim, Moshe said, I said to you, have no dread or fear of them. None other than the Lord your God who goes before you will fight for you, just as he did for you in Egypt before your very eyes. And in the wilderness where you saw the Lord your God carried you as a man carries his son all the way you, that you traveled until you came to this place. Yet for all that, you have no faith in the Lord your God who goes before you on journeys to scout the place where you are to encamp in fire by night and cloud by day in order to guide you on the route you are to follow. So Moshe says, I, I implored them, have no dread or fear. Look what happens in, in, uh, sorry, and then I'm just going to continue with this as well. Wait, what's going on here? Um, this is what before that I should have brought this earlier. My apologies. They then took some of the fruit of the land with them and brought it down to us. And they gave us this, this report. It is a good land that the Lord, our God is giving to us. Yet you refuse to go up and flouted the command of the Lord, your God. This should have been earlier. My apologies. I'm actually just going to move it earlier just for the sake. Okay. The, it should have been earlier, right? They took, they brought fruit. Who's they? The spies. The spies come in and they say, it's a good land. And then the people say no, and they refuse. And Moshe says, hey, what are you guys doing? Have no dread or fear. What's weird about this? Before we look at the verses in just from what you remember in Shlach. There were only two spies who said it was a good land. The rest of them said. Only two spies, correct, right? And, and the other spies don't show up here at all, Right. They don't, it's not, the, it seems like here, like the spies are the ones who are, uh, who, who just, they all say it's a good land. Not only that, and this is a, a, a kind of a, a smaller point, but this statement of Moshe saying, have no dread or fear, does not appear in Shlach. In fact, Moshe is completely silent in the book of Shlach, in, in, in Parsha Shlach. Moshe doesn't say anything, right? So we have here Moshe retelling the story where, first off, it is, it is, you know, the people came to him. He didn't speak to God, at least, right? It doesn't seem like he spoke to God. He then also warns them not to do it, but that warning doesn't show up in the book of, in Sefer Shlach, in, uh, in Parshat Shlach. The whole emphasis on the chet hamiraglim, right? The sin of the spies that, that is, is so you know, powerful and, and so uh, damning 
that also, I mean, the spies are mentioned, really. So what's going on here? First, I just want to mention, there's a famous way that Rashi deals with that initial uh, contradiction, the initial contradiction of who was it that commanded it, right? Was it the, because the people here in Devarim, it seems like the people initiated it, whereas in Parsha Shlach, God just says, okay, go ahead and do it. He doesn't, the people don't ask for it. Moshe doesn't ask for it. So what does Rashi say here? Shlach lecha, send for you. This is the commentary on Parsha Shlach. Ledatcha, according to your own judgment. Ani eini mitzavelecha. God says, me, I do not command you. But if you wish to do it, so send them. God said this because the Israelites came to Moshe and said, we will send men before us as it is said in Devarim. So it's not said here, meaning here, there, in Parshat Shlach. It doesn't say that. But rather, they come and they, uh, they ask. Moshe then turns to Hashem and provides, you know, and, and Hashem tells them, fine, you want, they want to do it? Great, go ahead and do it. And then they go ahead and do it. So Rashi tries to say, okay, well, well really, what's going on here? These two stories they work together, they work in tandem, they are filling in information that at different times within the narrative are necessary. So it's not that they contradict. We don't have things that contradict here, at least according to the Rashi's communicating it, but rather we have different pieces of the puzzle, different elements of the narrative that are required at different times. Thoughts, questions on that? What do you, you know, everyone's, I've been talking for a while. Any, anybody have anything they wish to share? Yeah, it's a, it's a new generation. They've got different aspects. They've got different ideas. They are not the people which came out of Egypt. Yes, exactly. And I think that's, a, that's you know, a, an approach that will take to kind of sum everything up. But that's exactly right. Meaning... The, the stories don't contradict each other. There are different elements of the story. And Moshe is choosing. It's not, it's not Moshe here who's like, oh, it was me and God had nothing to do with it. Or, oh, it was me and Yitro had nothing to do with it. He has to consciously choose which details to communicate that will be necessary for those people, for that new generation. If you remember, the entire generation who was involved with the sin of the spies died. Or, or, or are dying out before they get into the land of Israel, they will die. So these are new people. This is a new nation who didn't make those choices then, but Moshe is speaking to them as if they did. Moshe is speaking to them and trying to kind of uh, charge their national consciousness. It's, it's kind of like a corrective experience. In, yeah, in what way? Well, that he's he's kind of describing in the way that, in a way that's kind of in, in, empowering them. Yeah, by and, and by saying, you know, it's easy. It's very easy for us to just blame the spies, right? It's very easy for us to blame the spies. Or even you know, God. Hey, God told us to do it. No, Moshe says it's you. It's the nation. It's the nation. Okay. And let's understand why and what this will, will bring ourselves to a close. So this is from a Professor Yonatan Grossman, who uh, got, uh, got from the Gushet Sion, Harat Sion, Yeshivat Harat Sion website, uh, fantastic website, fantastic professor as well. And so he says the following thing, which is along the lines of what Leon was saying, but he kind of brings everything together. In light of the historical description, Moshe wishes that the nation understand the value of the Torah's existence and God's word. And now, Israel, heed the statutes and ordinances which I teach you to do them. Leman tichyu, that you may live and go in and possess the land which God your, of your fathers gives to you. Since Moshe has an educational purpose for this review of the events in the desert, it is important for him to emphasize the nation's situation and the spiritual level of the public at these events. The stories of the spies in Parshat Shlach focuses on the sin of the spies, while Moshe, addressing Am Yisrael, focuses on the sin of the nation. The ten spies who issued an evil report of the land are not important now. What is important is the refusal of the nation to go up and inherit the land. 
The main characters of Parshat Shlach are the spies. But Moshe plays the harsh spotlight on the behavior of the nation in its reaction to the mission of the spies. It seems to me that this then clarifies the different aspects that we've pointed out. A, Moshe emphasizes the request of the nation to send spies, since the nation is the central character of the story now, and the people need to learn a lesson from this incident. B, in parallel to the argument within the group of spies, which you read about in Parshat Shlach, an argument begins between Moshe and the nation. It is this argument that Moshe focuses on, because for him, the nation is the focus and the essence. And finally, Moshe is interested at pointing the accusing figure, finger at the nation, leaving them no room for excuses, for example, by letting them blame the negative report of the spies. And therefore, he wants to lessen the weight of the spies' words while emphasizing the capitulation of the nation. Within the spies, there were two groups, and in the end, the nation in its entirety decided to adopt the negative version. Therefore, Moshe quotes the words of Yoshua and Kalev, the land is good, thereby increasing the guilt of the nation. So we see here that these two stories work together, each emphasizing different points, but now as the Jewish people stand on, on the verge of entering to the land of Israel as a nation who didn't experience this thing firsthand, but rather was passed down from, from their fathers, they now have to, Moshe needs to focus on this particular uh, thing once again. And we do the same thing, right? We do the same thing with our own collective experience of these stories. The idea behind Tisha B'Av, because of course, the sin of the spies happens on Tisha B'Av. The, the idea behind Tisha B'Av and all the terrible things that happen over and over and over again in each generation, this is something that we spoke about uh, a few days ago as well. The idea is that we experience similar things in each generation. In each generation, we have to make the right choice. We have to make a conscious choice to do the right thing. And so Moshe here is charging the people to say, no, yes, it wasn't you there, but in essence it was, right? It was your nation. Understand that, understand that. And so in each generation, we as a nation have to kind of make the right conscious choice to, to fix the things that we can. Uh, and these are challenging, challenging days. We, we come up to challenging days once again now, and, and uh, you know, in, in, in light of everything that's going on in the world, we don't need to go too far. We don't use to, use, need to use our imagination to find things to mourn and to grieve over. Uh, but what we do with the grieving and the mourning is to then implore it to move us towards action, uh, towards conscious action, and, and doing what we can to fix this world. Any Thoughts, final thoughts, final comments, final questions. Yes, John. You got to unmute yourself. So. I was just going to say that also it's sort of related for what he summed up too, but it almost seems to me like um, the earlier the earlier situation is the situation where um, it's like uh, uh, Moshe's the defendant and later on it's like he's the prosecutor. In other words, earlier on he had a situation where he had to sort of protect uh, Klal Israel as well, because if he would have started accusing them and reprimanding them, then you know he would have been agreeing with Hashem all the way. And in a flash, mm. so Hashem says, "Okay, let's destroy them, all the rest of it, all the other sort of stuff." Um, whereas later on, once it's all in retrospect, then he can then he can open up and say, "Look, you guys, you really were stupid, and I think <laughs> you did the wrong thing, but you're not." If I say that now. Um, Hashem's not going to destroy you now or not the yeah. new generation. Nice. Know? Good. Yeah. Nice. Nice subtle reading. That's very good. Yeah. Beautiful. Any, any final comments? Okay. So I hope that was, um, you know, somewhat illuminating to give us a bit of connection to the Parsha. Uh, and yeah, we've got a lot of work for us to do, uh, but we also have a lot of learning opportunities over the next coming weeks. And obviously next week we've got the big, uh, Wednesday night with Rav Yuval Sherlow. Just want to remind everyone to make sure to book, because uh, if you don't book, we're going to have problems. Uh, well, I won't, but you guys will. Uh, so make sure <laughs> make sure that you book in advance. Rav Sherlow is incredible, and the other speakers are as well. So that'll be, um, I'm sure, a powerful evening. With that, I wish you all a wonderful evening and uh, a beautiful Shabbat if I don't speak to you before then, and I'll see you uh, tomorrow night for Kabbalat Shabbat or Havdalah after Shabbat.
Thanks, guys. Bye. Goodbye. Good Thank night. you very much. Good night, all. Good night. Good night, all.